So I'm Violet. Uh, I'm like a first year MA at Queen's University in Ontario. And I'm doing this study about like fashion and Chinese Canadian women's immigration stories. Do you mind to like introduce yourself a little bit and give some background? Yes. My name is Karen Darwoon. And I identify as a third generation settler in Coast Salish territory. My family come from, uh, I think it's a region called Huaiping in Guangzhou. Uh, uh, many, many Chinese immigrants in the early part of the 20th century came from Huaiping. I identify as a cis straight female, mm -hmm. Chinese, yes. and uh, also a parent, um, a married person, and a grandmother. Um, and I've lived in the same region of Greater Vancouver for my entire life, other than a brief stint in Calgary. So I'll be 63 this year. And when I was a small child, my parents moved me to the suburb. We lived in the city originally, in the city center. And um, in the early 1960s, my parents decided that our family would be um, have a better life, like all good Chinese families have a better life, move out, move away from Chinatown, which is what they mm -hmm. did when they were young adults. And then we moved to Burnaby when I was very young. Mm -hmm. And that's where I grew up and went to high school and went to college. And... Were your parents like first generation? I guess it's like your grandparents? My came... grandparents emigrated here. And both my paternal and my maternal grandparents seem to have come from the same region. So my paternal grandfather came to Vancouver the first time in 1900. Mm -hmm. and, and then he went back to China and came back with his wife and his daughter, who I think was 10 or 12 at the time, and they moved to Calgary. And I don't know where my maternal grandfather is from. And I don't really know very much about him. Only reason I know very much about my maternal grandmother is because and other researcher did a bunch of research about my great grandfather, who was a photographer in Chinatown in Vancouver. Was it one of like the famous um, photography studios? Yes, he was my great grandfather. Apparently, was Yu Cho Chao. I did some research on on him as well, like the photo studio, and there's like yeah. people like distinguishing the authentic and stuff. So I don't speak Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, our family growing up, we spoke English at home. Well, what my parents were mad at us, they spoke Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, if my, and my grandparents did not speak English. Uh. My grandfather spoke a little bit of English. Um, so when they would come to visit, um, I could really not communicate with my grandmother, mm -hmm. um, but I could communicate with my grandfather a little bit. The dialect that my family speaks is related to when I was a little bit older and met other people who are of Chinese descent, mm -hmm. I would use words that they didn't understand, uh, even though my parents always said that we spoke Cantonese, but it wasn't the same language that these other people spoke, 1978 mm -hmm. to 1983, which mm -hmm. is, I think that sounds like the period you're kind of interested in for me. Yes, because it was talking about the coming of age, which would remind yeah. me of like around 18 to like 25. And then your um, beauty competition was 78, 79. Correct. Yes, I would have been just turning, to, I would have been 20. They recruited me because I, I guess they found me through the BC Lions football club. The BC oh. Lions are the Vancouver professional football team. And I was on their cheerleading squad in 1978. And I think I was the only Chinese person on the squad. So you yeah. didn't actively participate in the beauty competition, but they recruited you, like someone invited you? Yeah, like you. I, didn't I didn't apply. You had to be invited. So I got invited by, I can't remember who. Um, yeah, it's a long time. It's like more than 40 years ago. I was really... A, I really had a lot of conflict deciding whether or not to participate in it. Why? Because when the Chinatown pageant people came to ask me, mm -hmm. um, first of all, I felt that I was in the wrong economic strata. There's a lot of um, money involved 
in getting people to come to events, right, to, to support you. Mm-hmm. And, and they have to buy tickets to come to, to attend the event at all, oh. even. And yeah, and there's sort of an, there's an amount of privilege in implied in being able to participate in this, this sort of thing because there's like comportment. It's how you conduct yourself. Um, it's your posture, it's your speech, it's the way you use uh, your body. Yeah, so there's that kind of expectation mm-hmm. because whoever wins this, whoever wins this competition is going to be the spokesperson for the Chinatown com- community mm-hmm. and also expected to sort of move in this echelon of beauty pageants. So compete in the local exhibition and then compete for the city and then compete for the for the nation, in order to be able to do that and to take time away from your work, that implies an amount of privilege, mm-hmm. which certainly was not my case, right? So I didn't work in fashion. Mm-hmm. I didn't work with fashion. Mm-hmm. I didn't go to an office where we got dressed to go to the office. Yes. Right. I, I worked in industry. <laughs> <laughs> I was, so it seemed like a very unlikely situation for me to be in that but then I thought about it the other way that well why not do that because then this is this is showing like this whole other type of person that could be in this kind of competition it was a really important time for feminism for the Mm -hmm. feminist movement in the 1970s and Vancouver wasn't really at the center. I mean, San Francisco, Toronto, New York mm-hmm. were all like important in Montreal. We're all super important cities in the movement. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't actively engaged, but I knew that there were important topics being discussed. So if I wanted to set aside that kind of feminist ideals that beauty is never something that can be judged, if I just like set that part of it aside, I thought, well, if beauty is going to be judged anyways, then I might as well throw myself into it and see how this goes. <laughs> and, and so there I was, like an engineering student, or not a student anymore, an engineering technologist, and mm-hmm. then later on, um, somebody who worked in graphic arts. And in this realm of people who are, you know, in, immersed in fashion retail and writing and these sort of more artsy people artsy people artsy feminist people but sometimes we were you know accused of being bad feminists because we were participating in a beauty pageant right but I always thought that feminism meant that I should be able to do whatever I wanted with my body Mm -hmm. and if I wanted to you know commercialize it then that's up to me to decide it's not up to society to decide certainly not up to my father or my boss to decide oh were they against you participating in oh yeah my dad was completely against it why because I was selling out I was a bad feminist (laughs) I was being a bad feminist he was opposed you might not remember that now, but he was, my dad was quite opposed. What was it like? Do you try traditional clothes like chinsum to participate? Like more the 70s clothing, contemporary? Uh, it was contemporary clothing for everything except for the evening gown competition, which is why I have this dress, which I, oh. half my body doesn't fit in it anymore. Oh. But, <laughs> do you want to see it? Yes, of course. Okay, I put it on, I put it on a hanger so I can take the camera over. Okay, so we're going to walk around. Um, mm-hmm. And hopefully, you, I think it's really pretty. It's just so beautiful. And it's very well preserved. Okay. And I'm, um, I don't know what it is in centimeters. Oh, do you want to see the detail? Yes. Uh, let me put a light on. I think it's uh, machine embroidered brocade. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the inside of it is, um, maybe you can see it there. It's just, it's not. I don't think it's bonded. It's just the inside of this brocade, right? Wow. I'm not a textile specialist, so I don't know how the brocade mm-hmm. goes. Um, but the he- hemming is all done by hand. Mm-hmm. It's really beautiful. 
This and is so beautiful. I think that they made the frogs by hand as well. They were, yeah, they would have had to. And you wore this dress? And so that was for the um, so-called evening gown competition of the, mm -hmm. of the pageant. Um, so it's like a one-timer. Each of us had one made for us by a local tailor. And um, I can't remember the name of the tailor, and it's not on the inside of the dress. So the dresses were custom made for each of us who were in this competition. And they um, were made in, in Vancouver. Do you get to pick the patterns or participate in design? No, we didn't. It was chosen for us. We even get to, I didn't get to pick the color, but I'm really glad I got that color because some of the other ones were like lavender and pink and really not very suitable to, for me. Okay. I, I'm happy that it was like some bold kind of color. Was that the first time for you to wear chinsum or chi pao? Uh, probably. Probably because it was considered to be a very special kind of a dress. Um, I know that sort of in like late 80s, early 90s, it went through this period of exoticism and like yes. everybody wanted to have a chung sum. Did you make it to the final round? Yeah, so, I mean, there's only one round because there's like only 12 girls. So. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, pageant organizers wanted to put us, put us in the community, in the mainstream community and in the Chinatown community. But we did fashion shows. And so the pageant organizers would pair us, would partner with um, shops to um, provide clothing that we would, and they would be an event to which tickets were sold. There's <laughs> always selling of tickets, right? Mm -hmm. There would be an event to which tickets were sold, and we would have a fashion show, like in a, it would be set up like a, in a banquet hall or in a restaurant or something. Mm. And so it was very interesting to be able to try on and wear some of these very contemporary um, Canadian, often Canadian designer pieces. Do you remember are. any designer pieces? Like which pieces were you trying on? Um, I mean, I'm sure that there were some Alfred Sung. Mm. Then there were some like Hong Kong designers. Oh. Whose clothes we were modeling as well, oh. and so it was through these fashion shows and um, photo shoots that we would be learning about, again, comportment, mm -hmm. how to stand, how to speak, how to hold your head, how to, you know, all of these things. What to do with your hands? Don't stick your nose. You know, like don't swear. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff <laughs> that that people were otherwise would be paying thousands of dollars. To, to learn these children, lessons? To learn these lessons. To have their, it's like finishing school. Um, only I wasn't paying. I must have paid something to be part of the pageant. I can't remember how much it was. Mm -hmm. uh, it was probably a ridiculous amount of money, but um, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And I still, you know, think of that part of my life. When I was a cheerleader, which also cost money. And there was very interesting times that I think were formative in, in understanding how to be in the world, mm -hmm. right? How to yeah. conduct myself in the public sphere. So. Was it like a 70s thing or was it through the beauty um, pageant that you discover different ways of being and being like young adult? Yeah, I'm sure it was part of it, but it was also a 70s thing. Mm -hmm. Very much a oh. 70s thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like we were on the tail end of hippies and um, it was the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, and so young adults were expected to find themselves, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. I had a very unadventurous life, really. <laughs> very unadventurous. Um, some of my friends were doing things like backpacking around Europe and going to India or, you know, doing doing some kind of um, adventure in the north and going out tree planting. But I was not doing any of those things. I was like, Just doing stay school. close to home, live with my parents, you know, work part-time in, in, I worked at McDonald's, for example, work part-time uh -huh. at McDonald's to um, save up money for tuition, worked mm -hmm. part-time um, in a lumber business. Mm -hmm. 
and um, in a retail business. I probably, it was probably like the most adventurous thing I did. Did you participate in the Pong the Kibis trend in terms of like dressing and makeup or were you like not? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, a little bit, a little bit of the, you know, again, tail end of the hippie era. Um, and my family's very conservative. So um, um, certainly once I left home, I had quite long hair. So the photo I sent you was, would yes. have been in 1984, 83 uh -huh. or 84. Yes. I found a photo, mm -hmm. which is from 1979, I think. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's super grainy because it's from when I was um, at BCIT. They are from the yearbook. Um in 1978 I think when I graduated okay yes yeah I was the editor of the yearbook mm -hmm. um, so around that time yeah there was like kind of um I think we called them peasant skirts so they like these um dirndl type skirts with blouses mm -hmm. um and even though half my classes were labs I still wore heels mm -hmm. to school um, it was just past the time when women were expected to wear skirts and men were expected to wear mm -hmm. shirt and tie to class. Mm -hmm. So that time was in like the early 70s and there were still sometimes, there were still quite a lot of men who wore like a button down shirt. Frequently they would wear a tie unless we were in the lab. Um, and the women mostly wore like suit dresses. Mm -hmm. Suit dresses. To class. Yeah, suit dress. So a dress and a jacket or a skirt and a blouse. And we had um, at that time, I think it was like this sort of like pussycat bow blouse. Mm -hmm. So button up blouse with a long tie that you made into a bow. Um, I had many of those. Mm -hmm. We still had, so we still had bell bottom jeans. Some of us had fringe vests, vests with fringe mm -hmm. on them. Um, long hair, big glasses or else the tiny like John Lennon kind of glasses right some of those I didn't have those uh, my nose was too small I couldn't have those <laughs> uh, these faux shearling jackets mm -hmm. right but with very with you know very long strand sheep like fake sheepskin mm. and pile acrylic pile jackets also mm. um, colors uh, some of the colors were pretty wild, like lime green, harvest gold, avocado green, and that funny weird orange that was in shag carpet. Those kind of colors were still kind of around mm -hmm. in our clothing. Yeah. So, so a little bit of, you know, ordinary business wear and a little bit of slightly hippie, slightly hippie. So like toned down kind of hippie style was what you yeah. were choosing? Yeah. Yeah. I'm certainly not a fashion trend center at all. <laughs> and I generally don't follow trends. Mm -hmm. And part of that was economic, mm -hmm. right? If, if you want your clothes to last, you don't buy trends. Mm -hmm. so that was the thing I learned from my mother. And uh, occasionally we would I would shop at a thrift store, but mostly department stores. Oh, okay. um, these are not around anymore, but like Sears and Eaton, mm -hmm. um, Woodward, which I don't think you ever had in the East. We, it was a West Coast phenomenon. No. Um, growing up and living in the suburbs, mm -hmm. uh, mostly shopping at like department stores and shopping malls were beginning to be kind of Emerging. had been built and they mm -hmm. were emerging so there were a few women's clothing stores and these shopping centers that mm -hmm. if I wanted something more special I would go to them but generally we'd be the um, department stores and the discount department stores. After the competition did you feel like you were like, representing the community in a different way or representing like Chinese Canadian? Um, not in particular. No, I don't think I felt representative. I thought, okay, well, this is done. I'm going to carry on with whatever else. <laughs> carry on. It was very interesting. And the idea of following all those steps. Mm -hmm. 
was an, an interesting process to explore. And now. then did your family or yourself have any Chinese like style clothing, like wear them to like special occasions or it's always Western clothing? 99% Western clothing. Yeah. Uh, my mom, I think, had one jacket, which is um, the same Mandarin style, but it's mm -hmm. not a fitted jacket. Mm -hmm. I still have the jacket. I might have it here. <laughs> I'll have to think about, we'll keep talking and I have to okay. think about where it might be. Do you, did you do like- Oh, um... makeup. Oh, it was very, that's one of the things that was kind of helpful about being in this pageant mm -hmm. that we did learn how to do makeup that wasn't western that was still very mainstream but no like nobody knows how to put makeup on Chinese people it was it always it was always hard to find foundation that was the right color um so I would make my own I would blend my own I would have to buy two and blend uh... them and there wouldn't be very many much availability any sometimes we would go to the U.S. Uh, where you could buy black girl makeup, mm. right? So for pale skinned black people, and then you mix that with, you know, with Caucasian makeup, and you could get something that's kind of Asian approaches, <laughs> approaches the right tone. And I still find that the product that is the correct um, shade mm -hmm. for my skin tone is often has a, a kind of a yellow cap when it's when it's on so it never looks right which is probably the other reason why I stopped wearing makeup because I was so fed up with it not ever looking right when I first started my business as a private chef I did some segments for the local tv station for mm -hmm. global news they came to my house and recorded recorded some cooking demos and I mean chefs normally we don't wear makeup in the kitchen oh yes Okay, because it's hot and you're sweat and stuff. Mm -hmm. But to do these TV spots, mm -hmm. I put makeup on because it was TV. But it was still, yeah, I still put on makeup for that. When you were participating in cheerleading and like beauty pageant at the time, do you do you have any icons like fashion icons or like um some some celebrity you were like looking up to to style yourself and stuff? I was yeah, I was trying to remember what my influences might have been. Um, so social media wasn't around at the time, but mass media was. Mass media was around. Um, I think Connie Chung, and mm -hmm. it's maybe before her time as well, because she's only about five or 10 years older than me at the most. Mm -hmm. She was a broadcast journalist uh, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And the first Chinese newscaster I saw on English television that I remember seeing and so she might have influenced that of my clothing and fashion choices a bit. I, one of my aunts is only 10 years older than me and she's Japanese and she was raised in central BC because mm -hmm. of internment mm -hmm. and um, I re remember thinking she was very fashionable and very stylish. Mm. And so I was heavily influenced by the way that she dressed. Um, and she had very typical Asian makeup, like the heavy eyeliner and mm -hmm. no mascara. She has lighter skin than I am anyway, so she has like quite pale foundation. In terms of other style icons, uh, I probably followed what was going on in Chatelaine and Red Book magazine. So those are like the two main two mainstream magazines for women. At the end, if we do like a creative challenge to say that your coming of age self is going to a fancy event that's probably like a gallery event, what outfit would you pick and like makeup hairstyle would you like go with? I probably would have had some kind of big poofy long hair. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, there would have been big hair, like with like permanent wave or something. Hair, that kind of hair, like curly, wavy. Mm -hmm. Maybe some kind of like long sheath dress. Mm -hmm. Heels. Maybe plat. Oh, there probably would have been platform heel sandals. Probably. That would be it. 
and I would have had totally the wrong handbag. The wrong because handbag. In my, enti- in my entire life, I never have the right handbag. Thank you、um, so much for sharing a lot of, of your stories and your clothing、welcome. and、um, life with me. <laughs> you're very welcome, Violet. I think I know where this other jacket is. So if you want to just hold on for a minute, I'm going to go and see if it's where I think it is. Of course. And then I'll put I'll put it on a hanger and show it to you. Carry you. I'll carry you in. Now that I put it on a hanger. Okay.、I'll、carry you in. Thank you. Okay. I don't know. Isn't that nifty? Yes. Seems like so amazing. Okay. These are again handmade frogs. And there's the. Ooh. I think I can read the characters actually. Okay, so this it says P and E brand in English,、mm-hmm. and this. Okay, so this jacket, which hardly fits me, yes, is labeled size extra large. Different, but then I guess if you I compare guess. it, I guess if you compare it to that dress, it is kind of extra large. It、um, is. And then the lining, the lining is just plain,、um, just plain silk. Plain silk. Yeah. Oh, thank you for showing them to me. You're welcome. Well, I've enjoyed the time that we've had together. Have a, Have a great evening. Bye. Bye.